Tom Broker. I'm a seismologist at the U.S. Geological Survey, and we thought we would spend a few minutes uh, this morning to update you with what we've learned overnight about this earthquake that happened on the Calaveras Fault. As you know, it was a magnitude 5.6 earthquake on uh, this segment of the Calaveras Fault, uh, about, uh, located about seven miles east of Malpitas. You can see on this map all the other previous earthquakes that we've had on this segment of the Calaveras Fault. So this segment of the Calaveras Fault is well known to produce earthquakes of this size and even larger. The largest was in 1984, uh, a magnitude uh, 6.2 earthquake uh, that seismologists call the Morgan Hill earthquake. Um, now, what we've learned uh, overnight was is that if we look on this uh, picture of the Bay Area with the, the bright lines being the major earthquake faults in the Bay Area, you can see the epicenter of last night's earthquake on the Calaveras Fault. You can see the smaller orange dots are the locations of the of approximately 35 aftershocks that we've had from this earthquake, the largest being a magnitude 2.8 that occurred about 2 a.m. this morning. And what you see is all these aftershocks, almost all of them, are located south of the epicenter. So that, in, in addition to our uh, recordings of the strong ground motions produced by the earthquake, tell us that the, the uh, earthquake started here and then uh, propagated or traveled to the south. Now, that's very fortunate for us because by doing that, it directed most of the energy in the earthquake south away from the most urbanized part of the Bay Area. So most of the residents did not feel the strongest shaking that they would have ha uh, felt otherwise if the earthquake had broken instead to the north, towards the Bay Area. Um, we, I wanted to uh, let you know that we do have geologists on the ground at, at the epicenter looking for evidence of cracking of the ground. Uh, one would not typically find ground cracking uh, for an earthquake this size, but we want to make sure that is indeed the case. But we do have a team of geologists, both from the U.S. Geological Survey and the California Geological Survey, who are looking into the ground cracking. Um, as of a few minutes ago, uh, we reported uh, more than 61,000 people have logged into our USGS website to report that they felt the shaking in our Did You Feel It website. This is the most, this is the highest number of respondents to any earthquake uh, using that uh, fairly new tool that the USGS uh, uses to see how the individual uh, citizen in the Bay Area felt the earthquake. And when we get such a large response as we have gotten for this earthquake, we feel that we can use that information to learn more about the earthquake. So it's not only a way of reporting uh, how you experienced the earthquake, but it actually tells us a great deal about that earthquake. Um, I think that concludes the remarks I would like to make at this time, uh, and I'd like to open uh, this uh, conference up for questions. Can you talk to us a little bit about the expectations for the Calaveras Fault in terms of larger quotes coming in the future? What's the forecast or expectations anyway? Yes. Uh, when we have an earthquake... Uh, would you repeat the question? We can't all hear it. Oh, yes. Uh, certainly, David. Um, the question was, could you tell us about the, uh, what this earthquake means in terms of any future earthquakes along the Calaveras Fault? Uh, over the years, we have found through experience that when you get an earthquake of this size and larger, that it can be uh, followed by an earthquake the same size or even larger in that area. But it's a very low chance of that happening probably at about the 5% chance. So it is a possibility, and we do want the public to be aware of that possibility.
but it is a low hazard, and we wouldn't want the public to be unduly alarmed about it. But it is a good opportunity to take a look at your emergency preparation kit that you all have at home and to make sure that it's up to date and that you can get to it. I know uh, until a couple of months ago, my kit dated back from just after the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. And I can guarantee you, if your kit's that old, it's not going to be useful for anything. So it's really a good time to, to look at your kit, throw out all the, all the uh, expired items, and restock it. It's also an excellent time to talk to your family members about what you're going to do after the, the next big earthquake in the Bay Area. We have to remember that this earthquake that we experienced last night was a magnitude 5.6 earthquake. What we're anticipating on the Hayward Fault is a magnitude 7 earthquake. That will have roughly 60 times the energy of last night's earthquake. So you can imagine what you felt last, people can imagine what they felt last night, multiply that by 60, and that's what they're going to be experiencing uh, in, in a Hayward Fault earthquake. So the proximity Well, I think if you read the entire statement, the statement says significantly increase the, the, the risk, the hazard, uh, pardon me, but the risk was still very, the hazard was still very small. And so uh, the state, I think, has issued similar warnings in the past. They're not very frequent. This is, a, a, in a way, a special earthquake because it did happen uh, very close to the intersection of the Hayward and the Calaveras Faults. On the other hand, um, I think I mentioned before that the, fault, the earthquake uh, broke towards the south. And again, I think that diminishes the chance uh, that this earthquake will trigger something on the Hayward Fault because most of the energy is being directed away from the Hayward Fault. Uh, Tom, this is Dave Roman. Uh, many, many reports of people uh, phoning in uh, indicated that they felt an unusually long period of shaking. Uh, is this borne out by the seismic record? And if so, does it have any significance? <coughs> Finally, how can we can we say how long the ground shook uh, perceptibly? Um, I'm sure we can say how long it shook perceptibly, but I don't have that number for you. Uh, so we'll have, to, we'll have to dig into that. Ken, when, uh, I'm looking at the seismic records which are available, the seismograph records. Uh, it appears to be a period of about 20 seconds. Does that sound reasonable to you? It's possible, and that would be unusual, I think, for this size earthquake, but it does depend on where you are. If, you're, yeah. if, you're, if your residence or where you experience the earthquake is a, a located on younger, uh, unconsolidated uh, geologic materials, you will tend to shake uh, strong, more strongly and for longer than someone who experienced the earthquake on bedrock. And one final question for me, anyway, for the moment. Uh, the, did you feel that a uh, list of, of, of reports indicated one report from as far north as Oregon, I forgot the name of the town, Seven hundred miles, but that's the only one from that far away. Was that a uh, probably a pneumonia, or do you, what do you think about that? Is it possible? Well, it's, it's, I I'd be surprised if it was really felt in Oregon. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll put it that way. I heard I heard something that. Um, was to the effect that if you feel a shaking, it's probably an aftershock, and if you feel a jolt, it's probably an earthquake. Is that a good rule of thumb to live by? No. Okay. No. Um, how you 
feel the earthquake, what it feels like to you, is really basically how close you are to the earthquake. If you're close to the earthquake, that earthquake is going to feel like the truck drove into your building. It's not going to be nice and rolly and being in the ocean swell. It's going to be a jolt. It's like something's driven into your building. If you're far away, then it feels like you're in the ocean and the swells, and you don't have that big jolt that you get when you're close to the earthquake. So if anything, it'll tell you how close or... Yeah, if you feel an earthquake and it feels like you've got a big sudden jolt, that's probably a fairly close earthquake. Any question, other questions on the phone? Yeah, Tom, can you tell us more about the Calaveras Fault? Um, how long it is that, you know, for those of us on the, the phone, we couldn't see where you're pointing to on the, the map. So I'm assuming it, it is the southern portion of the Calaveras Fault, but if you can just kind of talk about the whole fault in general and um, the capabilities the Calaveras has. Yes, the Calaveras, uh, well, I should say the aftershocks from last night's earthquake extend for about five miles. Uh, south of the main shock. Um, the Calaveras Fault, we, uh, the faults in the Bay Area have different behaviors. They're much like our children. They all behave differently. And uh, the San Andreas Fault, as you know, is a totally locked fault, and it's not uh, moving at all, and it's, it probably only breaks in very large earthquakes. The uh, Calaveras, the southern Calaveras Fault, close to where this earthquake happened is almost on the opposite spectrum, side of the spectrum. It's occurring close to where the Calaveras Fault is constantly moving. In fact, it's moving so quickly that we get lots of earthquakes along it, like some the people here can see um, on our seismicity plots. But it, uh, we tend not to get very large earthquakes. We don't get earthquakes larger than a magnitude 6.4 on this section the southern section of the Calaveras Fault. Now, the northern section of the Calaveras Fault, you can see is it has a different behavior. It has very few earthquakes. So, again, there the fault is not slipping past each other constantly, but it appears to <coughs> produce uh, earthquakes uh, uh, much more infrequently. But when they do, it does produce an earthquake, they tend to be larger. So where this earthquake happened last night, it occurred right along the, the transition between where the Calaveras Fault is locked and not moving on the north side to where it is moving uh, much more readily on the south end of the fault. 